nowadays, nowadays Jewish people, when they have children, they talk about, okay, wh when, when is my son or daughter old enough for me to start telling them something about the Holocaust? What age? You know, it's like a movie. Is it, you know, generated or, or, or you know, you have, to be, you have to be 21 years old to see it? I have no recollection of ever being told or learning that I'm a child of Holocaust survivors. I always knew. I have no recollection of knowing that my father was in Auschwitz. I always knew that I didn't have one set of grandparents and three aunts because they were killed in Auschwitz. With regard to my mother, um, as a child, I quite often was sick, and my doctor was a Jewish pediatrician who was American-born, and he wanted to know about the Holocaust. This is the 1960s. And he would ask my mother, and I would just be listening. And the story that I heard my mother tell the doctor twice, and I'll elaborate because now I know the fullest story, was as follows. I'll tell you the story of my mother, which is uh, uh, quite amazing. Um, my mother was born in 1931 in Moschiska, now across the border in Ukraine, in the Kresy. When the Germans invaded the eastern part of Poland, my grandparents, my mother, and my uncle were put into an agricultural work camp near Moschiska, right outside. And one day, a Polish man, my uncle only remembers him, he knew who his name was, but they just called him a nickname. His name was Punya. Punya came over to my grandfather and told my grandfather that tomorrow, the Germans were going to take all the Jews, liquidate the camp, and murder them. And my grandfather, my mother, my grandmother, my mother would tell me they put on four layers of clothing and they escaped in the middle of the night into the woods. And eventually they came upon a Polish village called, in Polish, Wotskavola. Now it is called Wolitsa in Ukraine. And in that village lived a Polish woman who was married with four children. That woman was a, was a friend of my grandmother's as they were children. They went to school together. But the wo Polish woman came from a poor home, and my grandmother quite often would give her half of her sandwich. They were friends, but honestly, as I understand, Polish Jewish people lived side by side. They did not sit down for cups of coffee with each other and just chat, maybe in Warsaw, okay? But it's not what happened in Poland. Uh, but nevertheless, especially children, they were friends going to school together. So they came to this house, and the Polish woman, her name was Ruszka Kopacz, her married name. Her husband's name was Michal, let him in. And for 22 months, my grandparents and my mother were in a barn. In standard Polish, you call it a studdler. They were in a barn. The, uh, Polish, the Polish family, the Kopaches, had four children. And this story I heard when I was eight years old, seven years old, told to my pediatrician. One of the children couldn't speak. He was born, he couldn't speak. And one day he started to speak. And one day the mother overheard her son tell somebody that in her family, in the family barn, her parents had dolls. So the Polish woman, of course, was quite fearful that somebody would find out the Jewish people were there because in Poland, if you were caught saving Jews, you would be murdered and your entire family, like the Uma family in Malkova. So she took her four children, ages about 5 to 12, into the barn. She took a chicken, she chopped the chicken's head off, and she told her children, if you can imagine this, 5 to 12 years old, if you tell anybody about these people in the barn, this is what will happen to you. When you're honestly 7 or 8 years old, it doesn't really strike you um, as much, I think, at least it didn't strike me as now, 
I think about it and talk about it. Um, and in addition, there was a Polish priest in the, uh, there were both Poles and uh, Ukrainian Greek Orthodox in this village. The Polish priest knew, oh, by the way, in the house next door lived Ryszka Kopacz's sister. And she had a barn. And in that barn were hidden for 22 months my grandmother's three brothers and sister. And the Polish priest knew that the, Jew, that the Polish people were hiding Jews. He blessed it and in fact told one Polish woman that if you save the Jews, you will automatically go to heaven. And I visited that church with my uncle, who is 86 years old and survived, and met the current priest. Uh, and he brought out from the back a, a big uh, portrait of the uh, priest who was there. And my uncle got emotional because he remembered his face. And uh, Facebook is amazing. Uh, Facebook, I mentioned, I met uh, Ambassador Lechner, Lechner, as he pronounces it. I posted about the uh, uh, Bernese group on Facebook, and the story, and a woman contacted me in Massachusetts. Her father was in Ilag 4, in Titmoning. Her mother was in Libanau. Now, they were not saved through the Polish legation. They had passports from Costa Rica in another way. <clears throat> but her father knew Jews from Benjamin who got the passports from Paraguay. And she has been researching and planning to write a book about Titmoning. And she was specifically researching all these Benjamin Jews who you would not know to find. And she put me onto a book, a Holocaust testimony. Uh, that was written and testified by Abraham Manella that Yenje spoke about earlier in his talk. Uh, and another man who lives in, in Cal who died in California, who was in the Beijing ghetto. So now we, now currently I can say we have an equal uh, group of uh, Poles and Jews who are working on uncovering the full story of the Bernese group. Uh, and I really am, you know, in, in, indebted to these people and what they've been doing. I think it's fantastic. Uh, and it's another one of the stories of valor. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the negative stories of people that did bad things, if they did something really bad, the person who was the consequence, the person who was murdered, never survived to tell the story. And the person who did the bad thing, the finger was never pointed against that, that person. But notwithstanding, we need, we need to especially learn the good stories, and we need to move on. There is no reason today in 2018 that Polish people and Jewish people and Israeli peoples cannot move forward and teach the world of the past not to repeat it as it's being repeated in other parts of the world. There's no reason whatsoever. Um, as I said, the first time I came to Poland was 1986, and I visited the Auschwitz Memorial Museum, and I was taken back by the fact that I didn't see the word Jew anywhere. I saw Poles, I saw Czechs, I didn't see the word Jew. And of course, now I was just in Auschwitz, and I've been to Auschwitz since. You see the word Jew. I understand that in communist society, there was no religion. They were Polish people. And they were, by the way, Polish Jews and Polish Catholics. Um, so in, in 2018, post-1989, I'm pleased the fact that it is recognized of the million, the three million Jews that died on the t lands of Poland. I just visited in, in April Belzec, which is an amazing museum they have there. Of course, there's nothing left of Belzec. In fact, 
people didn't even know about Belgius' existence after the war because the Germans totally destroyed it and there were no survivors. And I asked when I went to Belgium to the director, so how many people come here a year to visit? And the answer was about 30,000. And I was shocked by this little number of people that come to Belgium to see, I unfortunately visited several concentration camps. Each one is different. I said location, location, location. Of course, Auschwitz-Birkenau was the biggest, most people, the num largest number of people that died there. But it's also uh, geographically greatly located only an hour away from Kharkov. Uh, Belgitz was great location during World War II. It was an excellent choice of where the Germans built a camp because you had Lublin in the north, Lvov in the southeast, Przemysl and the rest of Galicia in the southwest. So that's why it was built in the middle of nowhere there. But today, uh, the typical tourist doesn't go to this eastern part of Poland, uh, but they should. And they should go there, and they should go to Markova and see that museum, which is amazing. I hope to, on this trip, go to Gdańsk and see the Museum of World War II. Uh, it's not a good location because most tourists, it's a long way, don't go to Gdańsk. Uh, I did visit it several years ago, the Museum of the Uprising, which I think is an excellent museum, as I think, by the way, the Pauline Museum is an excellent museum. Um, I think uh, all peoples need to go to both of those museums. By the way, I do not believe in the politicization of the Holocaust or the politicization of World War II to meet a current political motive or agenda. Okay. Um, I I, this is now my, my opinion. My opinion is that after World War II, Jewish people throughout the world had and still had the ability to mourn, to commemorate, to cry. Polish people Poland, after World War II under communism, was not able to mourn, to cry, and tell their history. That's a terrible thing. And now, and recently, uh, the history is being blown on Polish people. And there is, a, in my view, a um, current to try to portray things in only a positive way. And that's not what happened. There was positive and there was negative. Okay? Um, and everything to the extent known should be portrayed, but it, it shouldn't go on a scale to weigh. <laughs> you can't weigh. You can't say, and I don't want to talk about people saying today, well, uh, the numbers were actually greater about this or greater about that. It's not a numbers game in my view. It's not a numbers game. Um, and um, people, people need, in general, in the world, people not into history. <laughs> they're, not, they're into computers and sports and whatever. And people need to try to learn history. Uh, my Holocaust survivor friend who came with me to Poland told me that in her view, the problem with Polish-Jewish relations before World War II was that Jewish people did not know Polish history, Polish customs, let alone really Catholicism and what things mean. And on the other hand, Polish people did not know anything about Jewish history, Jewish customs, and what it is that we do. And of course, we look different, we dress different, and differences, look, if a, uh, a Hare Krishna would walk down Novishvyat, people would look. If a Hare Krishna would walk down a street in Kansas City, Kansas, people would look. In New York, not as much because we're such a cosmopolitan city. And unfortunately, people don't understand that Poland 
between 1918 and 1939 uh, was a cosmopolitan country. People don't understand, uh, of course they know there were Jews here, that there were Ruthenians and Belarusians and Lithuanians and Volksdeutsch and that there even were uh, religious Muslims. <laughs> um, and that's the history that needs to be taught. Um, and um, in my view, Poland should not be and is not, should not be a quote Catholic country. When I went to England and took a tour and I heard the tour driver say that England is a Christian country um, and the Queen is the, uh, the head of the church, which is fine. Um, as an American, I am set back by that, okay? Um, because we believe in freedom of religion. The United States is not a, any type of religious country by religion. So in my not being Jewish, but my wearing a hat as an American, um, I don't believe that any country, a Muslim country, uh, or an Israeli country should be a country of a religion. I believe in free exercise and be it there Muslim people here or Orthodox people or even atheist people. I understand from friends that it's, it was difficult. Religion is taught in schools in Poland, of course the Catholic religion. And it, it was a time when it was difficult for people who are not, who are atheists, there are atheists in Poland, didn't want their children to be taught religion. They shouldn't be forced to. In the United States, no public schools teach religion. You're, if you're religious, you want to teach your children religion, you, you take your child to your church, your, your synagogue, you can teach them at home. But the division, separation of church and state, I speak this as an American, not as a Jew, but a Jewish American. By the way, I, I view myself as a Jewish-American of Polish heritage um, uh, should not be allowed.